information class, were there activities that you all did that somehow were separated you out from the younger children who went to class that I made you special? I believe so, but I cannot remember what they were. Okay. I believe that's true. Tell I, me about the confirmation chain. What made you all decide to put your names on a chain, that 1935 class? They had been having confirmation since 1880. Somebody had the idea. I don't remember. I, I can't remember. I think your what it class was. is the only one that doesn't have a picture. Huh? Your class is the only one that doesn't have a picture. A confirmation. We're picture. looking for confirmation pictures. Do you there have? There wasn't. There wasn't photographs. One we did the, not have. No, one. you. That, I remember because I asked him. That was one of the rare classes that had no confirmation picture. And was the there one. a debutante type article in the newspaper that was written about your class? Because we've been looking at some of the archives, looking for um, articles, and found that some of them are on the society page yeah. would have. If we did, I don't remember. There was very little, if I was told, about your confirmation class. Very little was done. Except for the fact that amazingly you started that wonderful train. Yeah. And it, it is unique, as far as I can tell. It was in the an idea States. from one of the girls, I'm sure. And it is. Um, you know, and it gives a continuity um, and a connection to the building that um, that is in is interesting and is worth exploring. Oh yeah. Uh, members of the confirmation class of the years before yours, um, their names do not appear anywhere. Um, did anyone ever say to you, you know, we'd like a plaque too, or you should include us, or? Did they come back to participate in your confirmation, or you don't I know? I don't have any memory. No memory of that? None whatsoever. You said that confirmation was important to you, and that you did not have a it bar mitzvah. It was spot. important. Um, were your parents very proud? Did yeah. They, well, uh, it, it was tantamount to becoming a, from a child to a man. Okay. Or something like that. And, uh, and also, I think my mother expected more from me after confirmation than she did prior. Uh, that was the speech that was given to try to make me grow up and be more responsible. So there was a definite connection between being confirmed and growing up or being, becoming a man, uh, being a responsible person as opposed to being a child. You were no longer a child. Don't you think that was a good message? Very good message. Mikvah Israel is unique in other ways too, and that is that men and women were never separate, as far as I remember, uh, that I've read, in services. Were, were the education classes ever separate, or men and women, young boys and girls, were always mixed together? Always. Always mixed together. Always. And in terms of the... Um, the number of your classmates that continued. Can you, do you know of, of how many maybe became president or then served with you on the board afterwards? Because you certainly did become president of the congregation and served the, pre the uh, community well. Did most of them take your idea and think that it was important enough that they wanted to, you know, really help out the congregation after that? None of them. None of them. I don't remember anybody. The, uh, the girls went off, I think, and got married. I completely lost track of them. Henrietta uh, Steinheimer never participated in anything. Adele Schneider was from that class. Adele Schneider was not a group duo. Uh, now that was 1935, it was during the Depression. Right. How did that impact your class or the number of people that were able to come to services or donate to the strength of the congregation? I don't have a memory of a connection there. Do you remember hardship in your own personal life because it was the Depression? Or? I remember the strict rules. And we walked everywhere. And I wanted a, a big bicycle. And my daddy told me I'd have to go find the money. So I started selling Saturday Evening Post for a nickel 
and then ladies home journal for a dime and they gave you they paid you and also gave you coupons toward things and that's how I got my first big bicycle <laughs> I bet you were very proud that you had earned it yourself oh yeah that's how I got my big two-wheeler and uh, I was raised next to two boys who neither one of them got confirmed. One was Siegel Moore, M-O-H-R, lived in the next block, and the other was Hugo Frank. Hugo Frank's father, <coughs> who was Hugo Frank, married one of the Adler women, Alga, not Alga. Rena Adler, and they were rather well-to-do uh, because old man Leopold Adler had a big department store. And uh, they lived a block and a half away from me, so I played over at the Frank thing, and the mother had an electric car. You know they had electric cars then? Mm. And now we're coming back to electric cars, and it was. Uh, Remember, Rena Frank had. Huh? Rena Frank had an electric car. Rena Frank, that's who yeah. I was talking about. Yeah, she had an electric car. And the car was uh, like a living room uh, with a short back and a little bit of front, and in the garage, which was Atlantic Avenue and Victory Drive, they had all this equipment in the garage. And at nighttime, they plugged into the electricity to charge it. What year was this? This would have been through the 20s and into the 30s. That's amazing. And uh, prominent women, or well-to-do women, had electric cars. And had a long, huh? I knew that. You knew that. About the electric cars. Yeah. Um, they had a long stick that guided the to move it fast. So we went everywhere in electric cars. And uh, and they charged them at night. Uh, did they have they had trolley cars back in your days, didn't they? Huh? Did, didn't they have the cars that had ran on electricity? Well I'm just talking about individual car. Yeah, and then Seagull Moore that lived in the next block, his mother's mother had a lot of money and they had a chauffeur. And this was 44th Street. It was a dirt street. And we played up and down the street. Traffic wasn't too bad. And, uh, but everybody that I knew in the Jewish community or who I was associated with knew that Rabbi George Solomon was my uncle. Did he and have that a car? gave me a lot of uh, a lot of clout. Right. Did he have a car? Who? George Solomon. I'm sure, he had a car. Willis Knight. Willis. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, and then we mixed into the Gentile community extremely well. I, I don't remember any any Semitism at all. What about though in the late 1930s? when Hitler's rising to power, Mussolini's rising to power, things are going on in Europe, and then World War II. Were there repercussions to your business as a Jewish merchant because there were things going on around the world that impacted Jewish communities? I don't think it, it got through to us. You know, the damnedest thing about Savannah people was that uh, they were the class act of the country. And uh, just because Philadelphia or New York or some other place did something, we were over and beyond everybody else as Americans. So, I never had any problem with being Jewish in the Gentile community. 